Yo, you guys, this is Blacklist of the Abyss, and this is my review for Strike the Blood, Episode 3. Now, this one starts off where the last one ended. Kojo, his powers are going crazy, they're going berserk, he can't control them. Then Rudolph and a start day, they leave. They retreat, they get out of there, because they don't want to get caught up in that. And it's a good thing, too. Because while we don't see what happens directly afterwards, we do see the next day what the aftermath was. Now, there weren't any casualties, but 20,000 homes lost power. The mo some of the monorail lines were destroyed, or dam severely damaged. And there was 50 billion yen worth of damage. 50 billion yen worth of damage. That's a lot. That's what, 500 million US dollars? That is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot of damage. And Kojo and Himuragi, they're just talking about it in broad daylight. Like, it's not a secret who's responsible. <laughs> At one point, they're even they're at the train station waiting. All the trains are slowed down because of what happened. They're at the train station waiting. There are a bunch of people surrounding them, but they're still talking out in the open about about this. Like it's not a secret. I, I honestly don't know how in the world Kojo could have kept him his being the fourth progenitor a secret. Because every episode he does something that should give him away. <laughs> even later in the episode, well, I'll get there when I get there, but. The point is that they're talk they're talking, and uh, Kocho asks Himiragi, you know, at, about the Lion King organization. She says that she hasn't reported it yet, and she says the reason for that is because she doesn't feel as though he was legitimately responsible for what happened. Astarte and Eustache, they're mainly responsible, but she also feels that she herself is partially responsible as well because that only happened because he was trying to save her and she actually lists that as one of the reasons too because he saved her but when she said it it felt more like I'm doing this as a thank you to you for saving me not that only happened because you were trying to save me but that part's implied with the uh, you weren't really responsible for it but um they're talking about that they're talking in the middle of the in the middle of the crowd of the train station about him causing the big lightning explosion. They finally get on the train, and we actually get a legitimate confirmation that Aurora was, in fact, Kalei Blood, the fourth progenitor. After episode one, it seemed pretty obvious, but there was never really a, an official confirmation that Aurora was, in fact, the fourth progenitor, so now we have that. But, uh, Kojo, he's talking about what about his powers and how it's not his. Because what what happened was that Himuragi was saying, you know, yeah, it's self defense what you did, but it was a little bit ex excessive. And Kojo says, well, I didn't really have any control of it. That wasn't my fault. I couldn't do anything about it. And she asks him, you know, what? What do you mean? Why? So he says that he's talking about his familiars, and he says that Aurora's familiars haven't yet accepted him as the fourth progenitor. The reason being because they haven't accept, accepted him as a vampire. And they haven't accepted him as a vampire because he's still a virgin vampire. In other words, he has yet to suck a human's blood. So, and, and, that, and he hasn't sucked anyone's blood yet because he's, he's had those urges where his nose starts to bleed and he's been resisting them, using his own blood. But because he's been resisting those urges, I guess, oh, I guess you could say that those urges are his body telling him that he should drink blood. I mean, I, I mean obviously that's his body telling him to drink blood. I mean more like, um, like for instance, when, let's say you were addicted to something, but then you suddenly stop, your body will suffer symptoms because you suddenly stop, it's especially with like drugs and medicine and stuff like that. But the, being the progenitor, you're, sub, you're a vampire, you're supposed to drink blood, and being without 
blood for that long. This is his body's physi physiological reaction to him not actually having that blood. But uh, that's why his familiars, uh, they all, they're always out of control. It's because they don't accept him yet. And he says that he can kind of control them in a normal situation. But when he's being attacked, no can do. He can't do it at all. But um, while they're talking, Yaze ends up showing up. And they have a little bit of a conversation. Nothing big, but Yaze ends up telling... After, after Himiragi leaves, Yaze ends up telling Kojo that he shouldn't cause any trouble. And Kojo's like, trouble? You know, and at first I didn't think it was anything important, but the way Kojo reacted, it, like he said trouble in a, with as a question. The way he reacted to that makes me think that Yase might know more than he's leading on. And he might actually become pretty important later. So I don't, I don't know, that's just, that's just a hunch I have. I think that Yase is actually... He might know that... Kojo is the fourth progenitor, or at least a vampire. He might know that Kojo is not. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because he gives it away all the time. After, it, it, just look at episode one. Asagi asks him, you know, oh, you know, why wouldn't you be okay going to classes and stuff in the morning? It's not like you're a vampire. And he's like, oh, uh, 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 you know, it's it's pretty obvious. So I wouldn't be surprised if Yase picked up on it. Any any nor any normal person would pick up on it, but um, I'm I'm sure like half the people who watch the series, as soon as they saw that they're like, oh well, seeing as though this is anime, the chances are that guy is actually a vampire. But I guess we have the advantage of us knowing that this is anime. It's not like real life for us, while for Yaze and Kojo and Sagi, it is actually real life. But um. Yeah, so Yase might be important later. Then we go into the school, into the classroom. And then uh, we meet, a, well, not we don't meet Asagi, but she shows up. And it turns out that she's actually a part-timer for the Man-Made Island Management Corporation. She's a programmer for them. And apparently, while, because of what Kojo did the night before... The disaster prevention mainframe blew out, and she, and she had to stay there to like create a backup for it. She had to put one together from scratch. So, you know, I'm not a big programmer. I don't really know what creating a backup disaster prevention mainframe from scratch <laughs> entails. But I would assume you have to be quite skilled in order to do that, especially as a high schooler. So, Asagi, well, we already know Asagi's going to be important because she's has a pretty big part in the opening. In the opening, she shows up in the beginning, and she probably shows up a couple times after that as well. But she, at the most telling point is at the end of the opening where she shows up. And they'll have, like, still shots of, of different characters, and they'll, like, kind of zoom out. And there's this picture of Asagi, and she's just sitting there, you know, head in her hands, and she has this cup of water, and she's pouring it. So, I mean, I don't know if that particular scene means anything, but at the fact that she was actually given that spot shows that she is going to be important in the story at some point. And this is probably the role that's going to make her important, the fact that she's a skilled programmer working for the freaking Man-Made Island Management Corporation. But, um... Again, and that's yeah, that's another group introduced in the story. They're not exactly you know the Lion King organization with all these like special people and powers and things, but they are another group with a fair amount of power. So, so we can have plot involving them as well now, especially since one of the main characters' friends works with them. But um, yeah, so that's that's something that could happen in the future. Uh, it's. This is, this is another thing. Kojo, after after Asagi says that she had to spend all night like working on the backup mainframe, Kojo, Kojo apologizes. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. She's like, what are you sorry for? It's like, the, it's like the guy is trying to tell everybody that he's a vampire. I honestly don't know how he hasn't been found out yet. I honestly don't know. I really don't. 
But, um, he makes up some random excuse. Like, oh, man, you know, you do so much for everyone in the city, and me included, and, you know, I, you know all, all this stuff. But, um, <laughs> Asagi ends up, she figures out that he hasn't done any of his homework or anything, so she ends up offering him her report so that he can make something out of it. And they're interrupted by all these guys in the class. And <laughs> they, they hear about Hiroaki. They get a picture of her, of the new, cute, middle school transfer student. And they know that Kojo's sister is in class 3C. So they're, they're, they walk up to him. They're like, hey, you know, can you introduce us? And, <laughs> and then... <laughs> That's when Natsuki comes in. <laughs> she asks to see Kojo and the new middle school transfer student during lunch. And Kojo's like, Himiragi, what does Himiragi have to do with any of this? And the guys are like, Wait a second. You know her name? Wait, wait. Uh, how much do you know about this girl? How close are you to her? So then... <laughs> and leave it to Natsuki. She knows exactly what would happen. She knows exactly what would happen, but she she comes out and says it anyway. She says, I want to know every detail of what you two are doing together after you left the arcade in the middle of the night. <laughs> and all the guys, all the guys are like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Dude, whoa, dude, what's up with you, man? Come on. <laughs> And then Asagi, she gets, oh man, she is mad. She she stands over the trash can, just starts ripping the paper up and throws in the trash. She's like, <laughs> Coach is like, no, oh, my report, what are you doing? So that, so she got pretty mad. And and Kojo, he's he's, you know, being dense again. That girl Orin, I think her name is. <laughs> he she was like, dude, what are you doing with another girl? You've got a soggy. He was like, what, what do you mean? The two of us are just friends. T Typical dense protagonist. But um, after that, we skip to the meeting that Natsuki's having with Kojo and uh, Himiraki, and she mentions that there have been six similar incidents to, like, to that explosion that Kojo calls in the last two months, I believe. And one of the incidents is from the end of episode one. It's when those two guys that it, that it were hitting on Himuragi, they got attacked by a Starte and Rudolph at the end of episode one. And that's one of the cases that they see. It turns out one of the guys actually survived. He's, he's unconscious, but he survived, so... I mean, unless he's, like, paralyzed from the neck down and is in constant pain every day, then I guess that's better than nothing better than being dead, but, um, Natsuki ends up telling Kojo that he should be careful, because these two guys, they might end up, well, I don't, I don't know if they know that they're two guys, well, I, yeah, they do, they probably do, but they're telling, but Natsuki's telling Kojo to watch out, because they'll, they might come after you at one point, and, uh, Natsuki, but they're about, Kojo and Himuraki are about to leave, and Natsuki, she gives... Himiragi, the cat thing back, Neko, Neko Matan, I think it's called, she, gi <laughs> she gives Himiragi the cat back, and as Himiragi and Kojo are walking away, Himiragi's like, yep, she knows, she knows, and Kojo's like, yeah, you're, you're right, leaving that cat behind was a bad idea, I, and Kojo, I think he meant, Kojo meant that Natsuki knew that Himiragi was part of the Lion King organization, because I believe... I think Himiragi mentioned in earlier episodes that that like forest or garden place, like some place where all the children from the Lion King organization are raised, that Neko Matan was big there. And that's why she liked it. It was something like that. But I think Kojo was remembering that and said and when Natsuki like had the cat there and Himiragi said she knows, he just assumed, oh, she knows that you're part of the Lion King organization. But Team Rock says, no, that's not what she's talking about. What she means is that she knows about us, about Eustache, she knows about a start day, and she knows about the fact that a start day is a homunculus. And that's the first we, we're hearing of that. 
So apparently Astarte is just, a, is just an artificial human. And, you know, if you've ever seen FMA, you, you know what a homunculus is. There's no real need to go into detail about it. But Himuragi says, yeah, they know a lot about Astarte and Eustache, but they don't know that Eustache is actually the combat deacon of Lotharingia. These names, I swear. <laughs> combat deacon of Lotharingia. And, um, and she says that when the combat deacon of the Lotharingia Orthodox Church is involved, it actually becomes an international incident. And that's the Lion King organization's domain. That's their territory. That's their jurisdiction. And that's what. And so she doesn't want to tell Natsuki about it because she's the one that should technically be handling it. Plus, if she told Natsuki, there's no telling what people would do to Kojo because they can't legitimately prove, they don't have any evidence that Kojo did create that lightning explosion because, because of self-defense. So, until she meant, she says something like, they have to, in order to prove Kojo's innocence, they have to prove that Eustache was responsible for the defeat of an old world vampire or something like that. Not really sure what that means. I guess there are old, old vampires and new world vampires. I don't know what the difference is. Um, you know, maybe... Uh, just because he's the progenitor, I guess. I don't, I don't even know. I don't know. I guess they're, they're just two kinds of vampires, I guess. All we know about vampires so far is that, they, is that they're immortal, they suck blood, and they have familiars. And they, and they live on Itogami Island. You know, that's all we know about them. So, as far as old world, um, the fact that Kale Blood is the vampire, the strongest vampire. But other than that, we don't know too much about, to be honest, we don't know that much about any of the supernatural creatures in the series. But um, apparently, they need to prove that Eustache defeated an old world vampire. Maybe it's Aurora, you know, who knows? But um, they start investigating, they're trying to come up with a bunch of places that. Eustache could be hiding because they want to find him before Natsuki does so that they can get the proof that they need. And they end and Kojo ends up coming up with a good idea actually. Uh, he decides that they shouldn't look for like embassies or at Lothringia embassies on the island or buildings owned by companies that are operated out of Lothringia because Eustache <laughs> Eustache is probably hiding among other Lothringians, that way he doesn't look as suspicious. And he goes to Asagi, and she uses her position, the man-made island organization, corporation, whatever, man management corporation, she uses her position there, she takes out this like mobile computer and like, starts, this holographic laptop, or holographic keyboard appears and she starts typing, and after a while they find, they, they find out that all the companies owned by Lothringer or have moved out. But of those companies that have moved out, only one still has a building remaining on the island. The rest have been demolished or purchased by someone else, I guess. So they decide, okay, well, let's go there. And, um, you know, they're talking on their way there. They end up deciding that but there's some background on the company and stuff. It's like, it's supposed to say that, you know, it's a perfect, it's a perfect match for what Eustache is doing and like they were researching homunculi or something like that it's, I, I don't really care about that part to be honest I really don't um, all, it, all it means is that the place is perfect for Eustache to operate out of um, then Himuraki she's talking to Kojo she says he should stay here and I'm gonna go this is my duty I don't want you to get involved and Kojo's not having any of it. <laughs> Kojo's not having any of it. He says that he doesn't want her to have to deal with it alone. So they go in. They find this door. It has chains on it, but it's just magic. So that's another power in the series. I mean, it seems obvious that people could use magic here since Natsuki's a mage, but this is our first, like, legitimate taste of some of the magic that can be used, but it's elementary, so we see in the opening that Natsuki can create chains, 
She has like this magic symbol appear like triangles and stuff. She has this magic symbol up here. She puts her hand up, then like chains start shooting out. So I guess that's a form of magic. But this is interesting, I guess, the type of magic that they can use. It's probably not an illusion. Because if you touch it and your like, hand phases through them, then it's, you know, it's pretty clear. But it's probably some type of magic that like... Whatever, it's magic. <laughs> it's magic, that's all you really need to know. Eustache or Astarte, one of them, they use magic on the door. And they walk in, they see a bunch of these uh, tube things, like test tube things, huge test tube things. They have all these creatures are floating in there. And Astarte walks up to them, They're, she's soaking wet because she was in one of them early in the episode. And she tells them that they should leave soon. They, she says that the island is Earth that's floating over an intersection of dragon veins. It's floating over an intersection of dragon veins in like the southern sea, and that soon it's going to sink. And Kojo's like, what do you mean by it's going to sink? And apparently there's this cornerstone that they're going to steal. And once the cornerstone falls, the island will go with it. And Eustache says that the cornerstone is this treasure that they've been... This really big treasure that they've been hunting. And now they have the power... Thanks to Himiragi, they will have the power to get that treasure. And Himiragi's like, wait, what, what do you mean? Thanks to me, you have the power. You know, well, like, <laughs> you know, this isn't He-Man, you know, you have the power. No, I haven't done anything like that. And, but Coach, he's like, you know, screw it, I'm, I'm mad at these guys, and he, he gets angry, his voice deepens, you know, <laughs> he starts yelling at him, his teeth get pointy and everything, and he asks about Astarte, and he's like, did you put a familiar inside of her? And Eustache is like, yeah, only vampires have the ability to control familiars, but I created a way where I could insert an unhatched familiar into a, a homunculus and that just makes Kojo even angrier, angrier. He's like, do you realize what that's doing to her? And, and Rudolph, he's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. The, the familiar is, it's eating her life pretty much. It's consuming her life force so that I guess the way it can hatch legitimately. But uh, he says that Astarte has, at most, two weeks left to live. And that she could die any moment. She could pretty much die any moment now. Because that's at most two weeks. And that the reason she's been able to survive so long is because she's been considering... Uh, she's been consuming demons. And that one of the reasons she... And that one of the other reasons she's been consuming demons is because he wanted to perfect this spell that's sealed inside of her. But um, before I go further, I want to talk about the possibility of Astarte's death. I don't really think it'll happen soon. If it happens at all during the season, it'll probably happen at the end. Because, thinking back, I don't really remember Hustache being in the opening. But Astarte is definitely in the opening. So I feel like if she was only going to be here for like as long as you stash, then she wouldn't be in the opening. I feel like she's going to be more important than just a character that gets Himuragi, just a villain that gets Himuragi and Kojo closer together and stuff like that. Like, and plus there's this point where Kojo attacks and when he attacks, he tells her that she shouldn't be listening to this guy. She has no reason to listen to him. And at the end of the episode, she walks, uh, Eustache says, you know, let's go, and she starts walking away, but then she, she stops and she, like, looks back at them. So I feel like there's a chance that Astarte is actually just going to turn face, and she's going to actually become a good guy. I don't think she's going to die yet, but it's just a hunch that I have. But, um back to, like, what was actually happening right there. Um, Hiroaki gets mad at Eustache and says that she, that he's just treating her, treating Astarte like a tool. He's like, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I am. But guess what? You're a tool too. You're a tool for the Lion King organization. You're, the Lion King organization takes these unwanted kids and raises, raises them and teaches them all these techniques and how to kill demons and they use those kids for their, for their own goals. So you're the same as the Starte, I'm the same as the Lion King organization. They might even be worse than me. You know, how, who, who, you're getting mad at me, but, you know, look at the people who raised you. I've done, which, who is the worst, who is the worst of the two of us? So, Himuraki doesn't really know how to respond to that, but Kojo, but Kojo does. He gets angry and he jumps up and attacks, he attacks a Starte. Uh, that's when he says that line. He act, he has this, uh, he has his lightning familiar activated. It's like this lightning lion. And a Starte sheet, her arms grow out, then she forms this like monster, this white monster beast thing. And, it, and she's at the core of it. And uh, she's powering it, I guess. And he <laughs> Kojo goes to attack, and he gets one shotted. <laughs> so, so much for the fourth progenitor. <laughs> He gets one-shotted, and Eustache says, you know, yeah, this, the power, remember that power I mentioned before, well, he doesn't actually come out and say that, but the power I mentioned before where, thanks to Himiraki, he was able to get power to achieve his goal. Apparently, the, the lance that Himiraki has has the ability to nullify magic and cut through all barriers, but the only group, the only people that have that ability slash technology is the Lion King organization. So thanks to his earlier fight last episode with Himiragi, he was able to get the data he needed in order to replicate that ability. So Himiragi's thinking, oh no, I've done it again. Because of me, stuff is happening again. It's all, this is all my fault. So then Yustash walks up to Himiragi with this axe, this giant axe, and he's about to kill her. And then... Kojo step in... And he doesn't try to push Yustash away. Doesn't try to punch him or knock him out. He steps in front and takes the hit. And all the... Oh, man. All this blood just splatters all over Himiragi. And her eyes are like... Like, they're wide. They are wide. And then you stop. He doesn't stop there. He just... Boom! He cuts his head off! I did not see that coming at all. I did not see that coming at all. If this episode had ended when they arrived at the Lotharingia building, I would have given it a 7 out of 10. I'm not, I would have given this episode a 7 out of 10. But... Because of that last scene, because of the stuff that happened inside the building, all the information we got, and the head-cutting scene, I'm actually going to give this episode 8.5. I thought it was really good. Really, really good. Almost great. So I'm going to give this episode of Strike the Blood an 8.5 out of 10. It's almost been half an hour, Jesus Christ. Um... That's it for Strike the Blood. Um, I could get a freezing review out tonight, but I have to watch it first. And it's out on Funimation. And and while I do watch as many anime legally as I can, when it comes to episode, when it comes to etchy stuff like freezing, where there's fan service, and I know that Funimation is just going to censor it, I just do fan subs instead. So whenever Uryu fan subs gets freezing out, I'll watch it and then I'll review it afterwards, but I have to wait for that to happen. So freezing may or may not come out tonight, depending on when the fan subs come out. But um yeah, that's it for now. This episode gets an 8.5 out of 10. Rate, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you guys later. <laughs>